and I'm probably letting the cat out of the bag just a, a little bit too early, but I can't contain myself, so I'm going to, and I have the microphone, so I will. We are going to be bringing this service, one, we're going to try once a month, to Mesa State College. And so this is going to happen on October the 5th, excuse me, October the 6th at 12.30 to 2 o'clock in the middle of the afternoon on Mesa State. And I don't care who you are, I don't care if you go to Mesa State, I'm inviting you. We will be in the new um, theater is where we will be. We'll be in the new Fine Arts, Fine Arts Building. And so, so check that out. We'll have more information in the bulletin. And it's going to be a place that if you want to make that a, a worship service for you in the middle of the afternoon, come for that. If you want to make it a place where you bring some friends and hear the talk, the talk we're going to be doing is called Why is the World So Broken? We're going to do it in the series that we, we have around here um, that we have with just, it's going to be a question and answer series. And so we're going to do Why is the World So Broken? And then we're going to allow people to ask questions. But we're going to have um, worship, the whole worship team there, and it's going to be a great day. So anyway, we're going to have part of the worship team there. So it's going to be very good. We want to invite you out to that. October the 6th, 1230 to 2 o'clock in the Fine Arts Building. All right? So very cool. Right now, I want, to, want you to take a second and dial in to this question. What is it that you are thankful for right now? What's going on in your life that if we were to sit down and talk, that you'd say, you know what, Paul, this is really going great in my life. I am really thankful for this. This is what I'm really thankful for. Write it down on a piece of paper. Get a piece of paper out, write it down, and just go, you know what, I'm thankful for this. Because I don't think that we take very much time to literally list the thanks that we have going on in our life. We're in Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 5, what we read last week was verses 1 through 12. And basically what happened was Jesus, as you're writing those things down, Jesus has a bunch of people hanging out with him, and he sits down with the people. He has the people sit down, and it says that he begins to teach them. And the very first thing that he begins to teach them is he begins to remind them of the blessings in their life. And he says things like, blessed are you. Blessed are those who mourn. He says things like, Blessed are those who are gentle and lowly. Blessed are those who hunger for justice. And he goes through all this list of blessings, and he says, you're blessed if you do this, and you're blessed if you do this. But catch this. Here's what he's really saying. He's saying the blessings of God are on your life. That's what he's saying. That's what he's going through. He's saying the blessings of God are on your life. That the God of the universe is blessing your life. That you who feel like there is no blessings going on in your life. You who feel like, man, I almost didn't even make it tonight. I am so tired. You who feel like I am so overwhelmed that I feel like I'm just hanging on by a thread. Can anybody relate to me? Can you relate to that? And I'm just barely making it. And he's saying, you're blessed. That you're not just blessed, but you have the blessings of God on your life. He was telling them and he was reminding them of what you have. And right now, I just want you to take your piece of paper and I just want you to look at that and I want you to just go, remind yourself of what you have. I wasn't going to share this. Let me see if I have this. I was sitting right down here on Saturday night. And as I'm sitting down there, and you guys won't be able to see this, I'll hold it up and you'll be like, I can't see what you're showing me, but just pretend like it's really cool, okay? And I'm sitting right down here, and as I'm sitting in service, this lady just leans over and whispers, hey, Paul, hey, Paul. And I look over, and it's a lady that I used to know in Denver. And she reaches over and she hands me a picture of my kids. And it's a picture of Brian and Brittany when they're four and five years of age, actually three and five years of age. And it was just this moment of just literally going, oh, those are the blessings, man. Those are the blessings of God. And that we, that we turn, and, and Jesus is just turning to these people, and he's saying, don't forget the blessings in your life. And then after he reminds them of what they have, he turns and he begins to remind them of what they are. And here's what I want you to do. I'm going to read this. 
I'm going to read Matthew 5, 13 through 16. And every time I come to the word you, I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause just long enough for you to insert the word I. All right? You don't have to say it out loud. You can if you want to. But I'm going to pause just for a second every time I come to the word you, and I want you to just insert the word I. So he's reminded them of what they have, and now Jesus turns and he begins to remind them of what they are. And he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And so he's basically saying this. He's saying, you and I... We are exactly what God gave the world. There was no mess up, there was no screw up in that, that you and I were given to the world. And then I want you to flip over to your Bibles. I want you to go to James 1.27. And these two scriptures do not go together in the sense that the same person wrote them, but they do go together in what we're talking about tonight. And it just says this in James 1.27, which is one of my favorite scriptures. It says, pure and lasting religion in the sight of God, our Father, means we care for orphans and widows in their trouble. And we refuse to let the world corrupt us. You see, here's what I believe. I believe that as Christians, we have missed the buy-in. We have missed the idea of who we are what we have, and what God has intended us to be. We kind of catch this thing, it's like, I'm just this lowly little person on the earth, and I'm struggling just to keep my head above water. You ever feel that way? And it's like, man, what is going on? And so here's what I want you to write down. I'm reading this book called Salt and the History of the World. And the whole book is just on the history of salt. You should get it. But here's, here's the very first thing that I want you to write down. I think that as Christians, we should not make common what is precious. Don't make common what is precious. We have this innate ability as Christians to take the very thing that God made as precious and turn it into common. Did you know that up to 100 years ago, just, just a little over 100 years ago, that salt was the most precious of, was one of the most precious um, things that we had as far as commodities? Things, things, that's the intellect that comes with me, things. That salt was a precious commodity. And now what do we do? We see salt on the table and we think, oh, there's the salt. It's not a big deal to us at all. We take for granted. We take for granted the very things that God has made precious. We take for granted how much food we have. Did everybody eat today? It's good, right? How about cars? You guys ever wake, walk out and just be like, oh, I've got the biggest, trashiest car in the world. I wish I could shoot this thing. And some of you have. Some of you have tried. Or education, it's like, oh, i got to go to school. I hate that. Or my job, I really hate my job. I was in Mexico this summer, and I was talking with this guy, and we were hanging around the beach, and we were just kind of just chilling, and it was just, um, my wife was off somewhere, and my kids were off somewhere, and it was just me and this guy, we just ended up talking. And it turns out that he is the deacon of a church up in New York. And we were talking, and he turns to me, and he says, man, I was in town yesterday, and it just blew me away. I'm like, what? He said, I'm, I'm walking along, and this guy says, hey, mister, hey, mister, would you buy this item? And I turned to him, and I said, no, nah, I don't have any money, man. He's like, oh, come on, you have money. You are a rich American. 
And he's like, no, no, dude, really, I don't have any money. He said, I'm not rich. What makes you think I'm rich? He said, you are a rich American. He says, no, man, I'm not rich. And the guy turned to him and said, do you own a car? He says, yeah, yeah, I own a car. He says, does your wife own a car? He said, yeah, yeah, my wife owns a car. Do your kids have cars? And he goes, yeah, yeah, my, my kids have cars. I, I get what you're saying. And he said, you save money for cars. We save money for tennis shoes. And you see, guys, we have this innate ability to take the things that God makes precious and we make them common. Matthew 5.13 says, you are the salt of the earth. Did you know that every place on the planet has salt. Did you know that? The mountains have salt. The oceans have salt. The desert has salt. Every place you go has salt. You are the salt of the earth. That means this. As Christians, we are supposed to be everywhere. We are supposed to be valuable. We are supposed to take that which God has given us and make it valuable. Did you know that salt preserves things? And I believe that as Christians, that with Christ, we should preserve. With Christ, we should add flavor. With Christ, our lives should sustain life. We are to be everywhere adding flavor to everything. And last week, I asked you to do this thing. I asked you to write down on this piece of paper, what is the thing that drives you crazy? What is the thing that you go, man, if I could give my life to one thing, what would it be? Many of you came down here and we sat and we talked till about 10 o'clock at night. And we just talked about the things that, man, you feel like God is calling you to. Here's what that is. You are the salt. You are to use that thing that God has placed upon your heart to change the world, to sustain life, to bring preservation of who God is into a dark and lonely world. Not just become common. You see, when Jesus was on the scene, wherever he went, he was salt. You were the salt of the earth. That when he would go, that people that had disease would go and say, hey man, would you pray for me? And Jesus would bring prayer and healing. Where he would go, people that felt ashamed, didn't feel ashamed around Jesus. you got to know that my goal is this, is that Canyon View Vineyard Church becomes a place where people who feel shame can show up here and not feel ashamed. That's it, man. That when they walk through the doors, they know that the people that are here love them. And although there's shame in things that they've done in the past, they don't feel ashamed because of the judgment that is here. Does that make sense? And people who are outcast, like Zacchaeus was, become included. The second thing that I want you to write down is simply this. I believe that we are to refuse to let the world corrupt our character. He turns to the crowd and he says, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. We live in such an abrasive world. Sometimes I really become ashamed of my reaction to things. Have you ever been up watching Leno or something late at night and maybe it gets past Leno and now it's like 1, 2 o'clock in the morning and you're flipping through channels and all of a sudden you begin to see those compassion commercials. Have you guys seen those? The compassion commercials are the commercials where they show children. They're usually from a foreign country, but even right now, if you looked at New Orleans, you would think, man, that's America? But you're flipping through and you're checking out those compassion commercials and you're watching, and all of a sudden, it, up it comes, and there's a little kid, and the little kid has flies all over its body. And you pause for just a second. And the thought that goes through your head is, oh, that's a bummer. I wonder if Leno's on channel 12. Click. 
and that we have come so close and we've, we've been inundated with so many things that I believe one of the greatest things that Satan has pulled over our eyes is that we've let the world corrupt our character. Our heart should break for the things that breaks God's heart. Do you know that? Our heart should break for the things that breaks God's heart. Our heart should break for people who need to know Jesus. Our heart should break for poverty and for racism and for the meth babies that we have in our valley. Because of the hurt in our lives so many times, because we have so much hurt in our lives, that our pain will not let us see past the pain of those around us. And I believe that healing comes when people who know God, who love God, who serve God, reach out to other people who are hurting. That's where the church becomes valuable. That's where Christ takes on the meaning where people go, oh, it is Christians. I was really glad, to, I mean, not really glad to hear, but I thought this was a neat testimony that the Superdome in New Orleans holds about 20,000 people and that the city is reaching out to about 20,000 people through that one means. But, this, but around the Superdome, through the church, they are meeting the needs of 150,000 people. That in great darkness shines great light. You know, that we come to the place where when people start telling their stories, we end up saying things like, you think you have it bad? Man, I have been on Jerry Springer three times. I think Springer's funny in the sense that the one thing that he says at the end of each time, he turns and he says, may you never be on my TV show. May your life go so well that you do not end up here. John 8, 12 says, if you follow me, you won't stumble in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. If you follow me, you will not stumble in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. The Jews used to use salt as, as a symbol. When, when, when Matthew was talking about in writing this story and that Jesus is referring to salt that he has a much greater meaning than we have. And we look at it and we just kind of go, oh, you're the salt of the earth. Oh, that's kind of cool. I use salt on my potatoes. I have salt on my potato chips. That's kind of cool. It makes things taste better. But Jesus is saying this, that salt was a covenant. And that when friends would come together, they would make a covenant. And the, the reason that they would make a covenant is that salt has the ability to never change. That you can take salt, you can put it in water. You can... Dissolve that water, and the salt will recrystallize into one form. And it's just saying this, that we should have characters, character issues that never change. That when people know you, they shouldn't know you as the party guy on Friday night and the guy they go to church with on Sunday morning. That our character should be the same as it is on Friday night, as it is on Sunday, as it is on Monday, as it is on Tuesday, as it is on Wednesday. Because our character is the character of Christ. Because he doesn't change. And then he goes on and he says, you are the light of the world. Which is the third point. You are the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. What is the light of the world? What is the light of the world? You see, we get this idea that as Christians, that we're supposed to be this little candle. You know? Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. You guys want me to keep singing? No. But that's what we do. We get this idea that we are the light of the world. We're this little light, and we hold it up high, and it's like, woohoo! I hope somebody notices. And then it gets blown out, and we're like, oh, i got to light my light again. And then we hold it up again. No, we're the light of the world. The light of the world is the sun. That is the light of the world. That, that our future should be so bright, we have to wear shades. Yeah, that's good, huh? Like, hey, all right. 
that here's the idea, that we, you are the light of the world. Did you know that if you walked outside and all of a sudden there's reports that the sunlight just went dark, it went out, wouldn't you freak out? Wouldn't you be like, oh, geez, of course you would, because you would have seven minutes to live. That's what would happen. You are the light of the world. That don't let your light out, because if your light goes out, people are going to die. You are the light of the world. You are the reason. You are the hope that is living because of Jesus in you. You are the light of the world. When I was in high school, one of our favorite things used to, we used to do was we used to go up to the monument. And we used to play hide-and-go-seek in the tunnels. And it's totally illegal, so you probably shouldn't do it. But it was fun. A lot of fun. And when you're running through the tunnels and there is no moon out at night, it is so pitch dark. It is pitch black. You cannot see your hand in front of your face. But you see, that is how so many people feel. They feel like, what is the hope of waking up tomorrow? Man, I just feel like my whole life has gone black. My whole life is dark. The world is in darkness, and we are the light. And guys, so many of us, are we're just hanging on to that little tiny light. We're just hanging on to that little bit of Jesus that we have. And I am saying, kick it up. Turn it on. Light the world that you live in. Because you are the only Jesus that some people will ever see. And you know what else? I believe that 99% of all times, at least this is the way it's worked in my life, is that people need to know somebody who knows Jesus before they ever find Jesus on themselves. Before they ever find Jesus on their own. John 16, 33 says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Guys, we are the light of the world. We are the hope for a lost nation. And you see, so I believe that to be a protege of God you got to refuse to let your life be ruled by selfishness. We talked about that last week. This, for so many of us, we'll go a whole day without thinking about anybody but ourselves. And that when we live our life by selfishness, you know what we're really doing? We're hoarding the light. We are hoarding the light. Matthew 5.15, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. You see, the other thing about when you put a light underneath a bowl is it goes out. And I believe that if you are not sharing your faith, if you are not sharing your light, if you are not sharing the reason for the hope that's inside you, that if you do that long enough, it just goes out. It just loses its light. We're called to light, to be a light to everyone. We're called to give light to everyone. The other thing that happens when you hide your light is you lose your way. Have you guys ever been lost? My son, when he was about four years of age, we were Christmas shopping in Mervyn's in Denver. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching my son and he's hanging out, and he's right here by me. And as he's right here by me, all of a sudden, he's four, and he begins to take a step away from me. And I watched this very first step. And in this very first step, you could see that he, was, he had a plan. He was going to be, like, so gone. So he takes a step away, and he kind of looks around. Like, he's cool. He's by himself. Then he takes another step away. And he kind of looks around, kind of does this thing. He's not looking at me. He's just taking steps away from me. And pretty soon he takes one step back to where 
He can't see me anymore because he's four. He's this big, but I can still see the top of his head. And he's sitting there, and pretty soon he just takes off running. He's gone. We're in Mervyn's. It's Christmas time. It's in Denver, and he is gone. He's just running, and my wife freaks out. She's like, Paul, you got to get him. I'm like, no, watch this. This is going to be cool. <laughs> Run, sweetheart. Here's our chance. No, that's not what happened. And so I begin to follow him at a distance where he can't see me. And he's just walking along. Now he's shopping. He's just doing his own thing. He goes into the restroom. He waits for the restroom door to open up. He goes into the restroom. He does the whole thing, washes his hands. Pride of a father right there. Waits for the door to come out. He shops a little longer until finally he realizes that he has been gone a while. And he makes himself back to exactly the place where we were. But we're not there. He begins to look around. And he's thinking to himself, you can just see his eyes just going nuts. And so then he begins to make himself to where places we, are, we had been until finally he starts crying. My wife looks at me and says, go get him. I'm like, no, not yet. <laughs> She's like, come on, go get him. I'm like, no, no, not yet. And all of a sudden, he takes off running again. Last time, he ran for freedom. This time, he's running for his life. And he runs to the parking lot, to the windows, and he begins to look out, and he's looking through the windows, and he's crying. And he's waiting for the doors to open. And he gets through, and he's halfway there. And my wife's like, go get him. He's going to run out into the parking lot. And I'm like, not yet. <laughs> and so now he is fully concentrated on the fact that he has lost his way. And this lady opens up the door, and he's getting ready to take a step out. And she stands in front of him. And she says, little boy, are you lost? I'm about three feet behind him, but he doesn't know. She says, are you lost? And I said, no, he just thinks he is. You see, what happens is this, guys. When we hoard the light that God has given us, we do, we lose our way. And God has not lost us. But man, doesn't it feel like sometimes we are lost and we've lost him? You cannot help others when all you have is your eyes upon yourself. You guys, the world is not waiting for our sympathy. The world is waiting for our empathy. They are waiting for people who care. When watching this whole thing in New Orleans. And you know what? The one thing that impresses me is they just keep showing interview after interview after interview of people that have left their jobs to go help people who have no job. You know what? I can't do... I, 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 I just knew that I had the skills to do something. And that's a physical sense. But you know what? If you have Jesus, then you have the skills to do something. We've got to stop sharing our sympathy and start sharing our empathy. That we've got to do something. I'm going to give you a homework assignment this week, and I really, really hope you take me up on it. That this week would be a week that you say, God, I will be salt, and I will be light. Maybe you're going to be standing in line at McDonald's. The person in front of you has no desire or no need for you to buy their lunch. And you're just going to reach up and pay for their lunch. They're going to go, what are you doing? Nothing, I'm just trying to show God's love in a practical way. Maybe you're going to be in a class and you're going to get the opportunity to have a conversation or maybe you're going to be at work and you're going to take a moment to just take time to be salt. Just take time to be light. You know, there's only one known cure for selfishness and it's called compassion. That when we take our eyes off of ourselves, and we begin to have compassion for those around us. So the last thing I want you to write down right now is this. Make this week a goal to live your life in a way that causes others to seek God.
Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before men. That they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Did you guys catch that? In the same way, let your light shine before men. So that means this, that there are men out there and women out there, and they are walking in darkness. Anybody know anybody like that? And they are walking in darkness. And the path that they are heading on is taking them the wrong way. And this verse is saying, throw your light out so that they can see the right way to go. And we don't do it through our religious rhetoric, our religious speech. We do it by our good deeds. Good people don't change the world. But people who are good to people do. You see, we have a whole world and a whole society that believes that being good is going to get you to heaven. And so they just, they're just good. Just good. But you know what? It's not good enough to be good. We've got to be God-loving people and good to people. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God has made us to understand that the light is the brightness of the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back up, and we're going to finish up our service tonight. And I really want to challenge you tonight. Last week, we had a bunch of guys that sat right here, and they said, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I caught some of you during the week that said, hey, Paul, you know what? I wrote down, and this is what I'm going to do with my life. Gathered about a half dozen of us on Sunday back in that room and had a half do- a dozen of us say, this is what we're going to do with our life. Guys, let us choose to live our lives in such a way that other people know God. That's how you become a protege for Christ. Let's pray. Father God, I just come before you right now, God. And Lord, that we would be salt and light. That we would be people who do not lose our flavor. That, God, that we would be people who shine the light for others to know you. And so, Father, I just ask that this week that you would be with us, and that you would walk with us, and that you would talk through us, and that you would work through us, that we may live in such a way that we would be salt and light. And God, that we would also be reminded of the blessings that are in our life. And they are there because we are blessed by you. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Stand with me. Let's do one more song.